We are in our series about the parables of Jesus, and we have two parables today, both of them from Luke, um, and they are tied together with the message of the importance of persistent, persistent, persistence in prayer. Um, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, <laughs> uh, in those both of those books of the Bible, Luke helps us see that Jesus was a person of prayer. Um, and so today, our hymn is Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress, and grief my soul has often found relief oft escape the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bids me seek his face believe his word and trust his grace i'll cast on him my every care and wait for the sweet hour of prayer <laughs> our opening is in your um, email of the text for today. God is here. As we, your people, meet to offer praise and prayer, may we find in fuller measure what it is in Christ we share. Here, as in the world around us, all our varied skills and arts wait the coming of the Spirit into open minds and hearts. As I said, our parables for today um, come from the book of Luke, um, chapters 11, a portion of that, and uh, chapter 18, a portion. Uh, the title that we've given this is Persist in Prayer. And sometimes it's important um, in fact, I would always encourage it when you are reading scripture on your own and there is a passage that you are specifically attending to, to go back and read a little bit before and continue to read a little bit after because the context in which the scripture you're studying is embedded has an influence on interpretation. <coughs> Um, as is in the 11th chapter of Luke, because the 11th chapter of Luke starts with the disciples having observed Christ um, in his uh, prayer times, ask, 
him to teach them to pray. And he does. And in the first five verses, he is teaching the Lord's, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And when he finishes with the model prayer that he uh, offers for them, then he adds on some additional teaching about, uh, teaching points about prayer. And that's where we pick up for our uh, lesson today. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine has come on a journey to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't give up, get up and get you anything. Um, I want to look at a little bit of that before we continue. One, it's important for us to know that a very important, serious aspect of first century life in the Middle East, their, their one of, of cultural significance was the uh, expectation of hospitality given. And a failure in hospitality was considered by the whole community to be a serious offense. And so that was what was driving um, the, the individual in this in this parable was someone had show, was on a journey a friend of theirs was on a journey stopped by their house and they wanted to be able not only to offer them a place to sleep but to offer them a meal and they didn't have any bread well in those days unlike today in those days there were no stores that were open 24 7 where he could run to the corner um, 7-Eleven or whatever and get, pick up a loaf of bread. The next consideration is in their homes, most of the um, general population did not have a bedroom for each individual child or a bedroom for the children and a bedroom for the parents. Um, their home was, the spaces in their homes were very limited and the whole family slept on mats on the floor side by side. That was the most common sleeping arrangement and the animals, chickens, cows, sheep, were in the next room. Imagine what it was like trying to get everybody quieted down at night. And in this case, the friend you are imposing on says, I can't get up and give you anything. Everybody's already in bed. Because one member in this situation, one member of the family getting up would potentially disturb the others and set off the raucous cries of children or animals um, now that they're already settled. Now, the neighbor isn't, a bad sort of guy. He would like to help out, but the risk was too great for him in disrupting his family. But Jesus says, even though he tells you no, that he can't give you anything, verse 8 says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, Yet because of your shameless audacity, the asking, the requesting, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock 
and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. That is a rich promise. Um, I'd like for you to spend some time thinking about why is prayer important? What happens during prayer? And you can spend some time thinking about your personal experiences with God in your prayer time, but one of the things that happens in prayer is prayer facilitates aligning us with God, connecting us with God. And all of that makes us more aware of God's continuing activity and trustworthiness in our lives. So previously, a few verses back, he has told them to pray, uh, asking for forgiveness and reminding them to extend mercy. He is, uh, thanksgiving has been given, honor and praise has been given, and uh, a request for the fulfillment of needs. And this establishment, the desire to establish a connection with the Lord God Almighty. It goes, Jesus goes on to say, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who who ask him. So as Jesus gave them the model for uh, what a prayer, the, the components of a prayer to the Lord um, might have in it, he also says this promise that when you make a supplication, when you make a petition to God for your needs, if it is done within the spirit of God's will, that it will be given you. It doesn't say when, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but he's, if you seek God, you're going to find him. If you knock at the door the door to that relationship will be open. The door to the kingdom will be open. <clears throat> and if earthly fathers give good things to their children and they're weak, uh, the fathers are weak and flawed, and they still give their children good gifts, how much more Father in heaven will provide for his chosen children? Moving on to Luke 18, same message about persistence in prayer. Verse 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He wanted to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Wasn't a good guy. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. You notice the widow... Uh, we know from our previous studies over the years that widows were some of the most vulnerable folks within um, within that culture. And um, 
the the part there he, she <coughs> she kept coming to him with the same request grant me justice against my adversary the widow had suffered an unnamed but we assume a severe injustice and there was little hope for her to get what was rightfully hers if she doesn't get justice it's quite likely that soon her life would be reduced to being a beggar on the street or turning to prostitution to support herself her only real chance at at a a satisfying life is with this judge verse 4 says for some time he refused but finally he said to himself even though I don't fear God or care what people think yet because this widow keeps bothering me I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Some translations say, so she won't wear me out or she won't give me a black eye. <clears throat> so it appears that the widow had one thing going for her. She might have been vulnerable, but she was persistent. She was stubborn. And he probably the judge probably didn't want to admit that he she had beaten him so this sounds like some justification that he's making i don't fear i'm not doing it because i fear god and i'm not doing it because i care what people think but i better go ahead and take care of this situation before um I need protection from her. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. There's an adjective there, unjust. He's not a good guy. But listen, because if he will eventually provide what the justice the woman was seeking, he goes, Jesus goes on, will not God, and there's not an adjective there, but if you add it in and will not let, and will not a great and loving God bring about justice for his chosen ones. If this unjust man provides justice, how much more would our loving and great and powerful God bring about justice for us, his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? On the earth that's what God is seeking is folks who have faith in their response to him is that what Christ will find when he comes again so Jesus is dealing with the same issue in these two parables if you have ever prayed at length for uh, even for years, for deliverance for yourself or for deliverance for others from some troubling circumstance, you realize that unanswered prayer is not just a theological question. Unanswered prayer is a pain that you face continually until you become aware of God's response. <clears throat> Not every prayer is answered affirmatively. Many prayers are not answered 
immediately. Um, not every hope expressed in prayer is fulfilled. Sometimes the timing is not right, and often we are required to wait. Jesus taught in the first uh, few verses of chapter 11 in Luke, when he taught the Lord's Prayer, part of it was to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's will happens when God's people work, love, give, and pray to make it happen. There is something, and we recognize this, there is something at work in this world of ours that doesn't want God's will to happen. Jesus is telling us that we live in a world where good doesn't necessarily win today. But where we have faith, that good will win in the long run. The importance of persistence in prayer. Why would Jesus make sure that that was a, um, something his disciples learned? that they should persist in prayer. Maybe because he knew that human nature was to pray for what you need. And if you don't get it right away, to run out of hope, run out of faith, and just let go of it. Sometimes we do that. We just give up. He wanted his followers to know that persistence in prayer strengthens our faith. And he wants us to keep bringing our request before God, believing that he will answer, believing that he hears, believing that he cares, and believing that he will respond so we don't give up. We can be certain that God is on our side. God's answer may be no, because our request was made without the knowledge that he has. Um, the answer may be wait because the time is not right. We know that before his crucifixion, Jesus asked for the cup to pass. And that was denied because in order for God's ultimate will to be fulfilled, that was part of the plan, an essential part of the plan, the sacrifice. So we see that even Jesus, when he prayed, let this cup pass, followed it immediately with, but your will, not mine, be done. This is what he taught in the Lord's Prayer. This is what he modeled in his own prayer life, that prayers to God seeking for his will to come to fruition and for you to be part of his will coming to fruition, that those will eventually be answered. And maybe not immediately, but in the long run. We can be uh, persistent 
with a holy audacity. We know God is on the side of right. And our perception of right may be limited, but we should be functioning with the intention to line up with God's will as much as we can understand it. Watch. Wait. Listen for Jesus. Pray without ceasing. And if he seems silent, just keep knocking. He is on your side. Our um, joys and concerns, we in particular um, want to lift up, continue to lift up Fong Sun. She is improving in her uh, back pain and hip pain. Uh, but still has a way to go, uh, to continue to pray for Gary Heiner's sister, Linda, who is um, struggling in her battle with cancer, um, to pray for Donna Williams' friend, Dottie, in her struggles recovering from cancer, um, for Robert Sanders, who is having some difficulty retaining fluid and uh, prayers that his the doctors will be able to determine um, a course of treatment that will give him some relief. Um, and pray for, for Alice's comfort and strength and peace uh, as she tends to Robert. Um, we It was a joy to have um, Don Henderson back with us Sunday, just for, he was here for a short time for some choir practice, and he's on his way back to Wisconsin today, I think. Um, I, I thought of someone else just a minute ago, and prayers for the Mikulskis, uh, for both of them to recover and gain some healing in their health situations. Um, Dottie Lance and Vivian and Knox Montgomery, who have not been able to um, come and be at worship and be in, in Sunday school with us for since before COVID, um, but we, we want them to know that we are caring about them and lifting them up and covering them with prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you with heads bowed. recognizing your greatness, recognizing your power and your love and your mercy and your grace. We see your works all around us. They enhance our every breath, and every sight and every sound we hear, every fragrance that we breathe in. The world you have created and us for and uh, the, the wonders of it lift us up and point us to you. And we want to be part of that, Father, pointing to you. We want to be those that point others to you. They see in us, we hope, grace and mercy, compassion, gentleness, love, joy. 
all the gifts of your spirit. And when they see those, they are pointed toward you and develop a curiosity about who you are and what you can do in their lives, how they can be transformed. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We've lifted up those that are missing from us today, but for each of those that um, are here with us, and whose prayer requests have gone unspoken, we know that you know what's on their hearts and minds, what's burdening them, what's challenging them, what's hurting them. And each of us, in turn, lays that burden down at your feet, and thanks you for the rest. We thank you for the rest that you make available to us. And around the world, Father, we see those in our hearts are breaking for those who are suffering all sorts of human conditions, grief, hunger, thirst, pain, sorrow, sadness, greed, poverty, oppression, violence, war, hatred. There's so much better available, Father, available in you. That all those who are suffering could find rest, could find relief, could find joy, could find peace, could find satisfaction and contentment, could find all of your good gifts that you have made available to us. And that's our hope that the day of sorrow will cease, that the day of pain will cease, that the day of alienation and division will cease, and we, as your chosen people, can serve and live in harmony and unity of spirit in you and for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing, Lord of all of church and kingdom, in an age of change and doubt, keep us faithful to the gospel. Help us work your purpose out. Here, in this day's dedication, all we have to give, receive. We who cannot live without you, we adore you, we believe. Amen.